you guys so much for leading us in worship, and we do welcome you again. Thank you for being here today. My name's Danny Forshee, the pastor here at Great Hills Baptist Church. Coming up on 13 years, it's kind of hard to believe, but this summer will be 13 years that I've had the honor and the privilege of serving you as your lead pastor. And so, um, thank you very much. Um, just a couple things I want to share with you before we get into our, our, our message today out of the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 24, and we're making our way through the book of Acts in lightning speed, aren't we? I mean, we're just going through the book of Acts so quick, uh, four plus years. Um, as Jeff said, uh, we do want to welcome our guest, and Ashley and I, we, we really enjoy after the service, we go to the coffee shop, all the first time guests uh, get to interact with you a little bit, get to uh, sometimes get to pray over you, we give you a gift. And then after the, the first time guests have come, Ashley and I, we stay. I'm usually one of the last ones to leave the campus, and that and allows me opportunity to engage and fellowship with some of our church members, uh, and I enjoy that, and I enjoy being with you. And then uh, we usually grab a quick bite to eat, and Ashley uh, reports for duty at 3 o'clock up at our uh, other campus at Liberty Hill. She begins serving there. She's in the children's ministry helping there, and I show up uh, about 5 o'clock and, and preach and so um, that's our Connect Church up at Liberty Hill. God is continuing to bless as we send out people from this fellowship to help start that fellowship, and it's continuing to grow and reach people. And God is just giving our churches, both campuses, lots of favor, and I'm, and I'm very, very grateful. Jeff, thank you for mentioning the Gideons. What a great ministry. I had so much fun. Those people who preach you, they preach you hard. I mean, I, I say something, they say amen, and so they love the Word of God and they love to share the gospel. And those are the two of my passions in this life. And so I was their Bible teacher for their 85th annual conference here. They held it at the Double Tree, just south of us here on I-35. Jeff and Lori led worship. I don't know how many times y'all sang. Did y'all count how many times? I mean, it was at least a dozen, a dozen times. And they were the featured worship leaders, and I was privileged to be able to preach God's word. And we have many Gideons in our ministry, in our church, and I appreciate them so much. Uh, very much, and if you would, help us support them. This is such a worthwhile, powerful ministry of distributing the gospel, sharing the New Testament uh, all over the world, and so God bless you, Gideons. Last thing I want to share with you, I did another What's Next video, and it's out. Uh, it should be in your mailbox at home, not in your physical mailbox, but in your email mailbox. It's about 11 minutes, so it took me a little bit of time, but I'm trying to share with you, especially uh, just trying to share with you some of the excitement and some of the things that are going on as far as what's next, what we're planning, what we're praying about, and we're real excited about that. And it will also be on our website. If you want to go on our website and check it out, that would be, that would be great. All right, we're in Acts chapter 24. I'd love for you to open up your Bibles, open up your heart and your mind to receive God's Word to you today. And like uh, Jeff, I've been struggling with these allergies. I had a sneezing attack yesterday right before I preached, and that was a lot of fun. If you've ever had that happen to you, right before you're supposed to speak, you just, I mean, I could not quit sneezing, but y'all pray for me and my voice. Jeff, I could sing bass today, brother. I'm telling you, I, I, and tonight, I could sing double dose bass, you know, it'd be really low. So we're in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 24, and last week we were studying the prosecution of the Apostle Paul. You say, Really? Paul was prosecuted for his faith, and he was, uh, by the Sanhedrin, which was the religious, political, governing body of the Jews. They met in Jerusalem, um, but they pursued him 65 miles north to Caesarea by the sea, and there they hired them a prosecuting attorney, a man by the name of Tertullus. Can you imagine, with the money they had and the resources, they could hire, hire the first-rate prosecuting attorney, and they did, and they prosecuted the Apostle Paul, and their claims, as you're going to see uh, today, Paul refutes each one of them. Paul was the defendant as well as the defense attorney at his own case. The judge, there was really no jury, the only judge and jury tied up in one uh, was a man by the name of Felix, and Felix was the governor of of that whole jurisdiction, that whole area, that it included not only Israel, uh, but also other precincts and jurisdictions. And so Paul appears before, you say, well, how in the world did Paul get himself in such a predicament? 
I mean, aren't we as Christians just supposed to lay low, you know, and not say anything? Aren't we just supposed to kind of fly under the radar, not ruffle any feathers, and, and not be so bold and audacious with our faith? Aren't, isn't that what we're supposed to do? That's what Christians in America do. That's what we have become experts at, lying low, not speaking out because we don't want to ruffle any feathers. We don't, uh, we don't want to co-mingle religion and politics. We just, want to, we just want to go along our business. And Paul would say, I don't know what y'all are talking about. I'm telling you, there are times when you got to stand up and step out and be known and be bold and audacious even and conspicuous in your faith, in your verbal testimony for Jesus Christ, especially when the gospel is at hand or at stake. And so Paul does, he speaks the truth and it gets himself in hot water. I'm reading an interesting book right now and um, I want to recommend it to you. I'm about halfway through it. It's called A Letter to the American Church and it's written by Eric Metaxas. It is a strong, strong, I'm reading like three books right now. I'm reading the biography of Walt Disney, which is very fascinating. I'm reading another book about I, from a Harvard professor. I don't even know how to describe that book, so I'm not even gonna try. It's really, really interesting. But this one, Letters to the American Church, his premise is the American church in 2023 is exactly where the German church was in the 1930s. That's the whole premise of his book, that as the German church was quiet and they would not protest what Hitler was doing. They just said, you know, we're just going to fly underneath the radar. We're not going to speak up. We're not going to speak out. Eric Metaxas says we are in the absolutely identical place that they were, especially pastors in America who are afraid to speak up for life, to speak up for marriage, to speak up that there's one uh, biological male and there's one biological female, and that's it. That's all you got as far as gender. Now, having said that, there was a guy in Britain that just said what I just said. His denomination turned him in, and the government wants to put him on a terrorist watch list for speaking what I just shared with you today. And so I know it's a temptation just to fly under the radar, but here's the thing. You cannot be obsessed with Jesus Christ and keep your mouth shut. You can't. Wow, Pastor, that's a kind of a tough way to start a sermon. Guys, we're in a tough way. Our nation is in a very, very precarious, difficult place. Metaxas goes on to say, you think the Holocaust was horrible, and it was. Watch what will happen in this nation and in this world if the church of Jesus Christ doesn't waken from our slumber, get over our petty differences, and stand up and speak out for things that matter like the sanctity of human life, that life is precious from the womb all the way to the tomb, glory to God, that marriage is a sacred union between a man and a woman, and that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. These bedrock cardinal doctrines that we hold and that we cherish, and I made this statement to the Gideons yesterday, and I wanna say it to our church and just remind us, we are no more like Christ and the early church than when we're being persecuted. And when people are looking down upon us, and I know that's hard for us in America because we're so uh, obsessed with success and we're just intoxicated with everybody liking us. And so I wanna share with you this message, how to be obsessed with Jesus Christ. And we're gonna follow Paul's blueprint, his script on how to do this. And here's the thing, Paul is so bold, church. And the reason he's so bold, and it's the same reason that you and I should be equally bold in our proclamation of the gospel, and here's why. We win. We win. We, we are on the winning team. And the Lord affirmed this in Paul. He came to Paul and he told him in Acts 23, 11, in that prison cell there in, in uh, Herod's Praetorium, he says, listen to me, Paul. You're not gonna die here in Jerusalem, and you're not gonna die up in Caesarea. You are going to live. And I am, I am going to use you, Paul, all the way to the uttermost parts of the earth when you go to Rome. Yes, Paul, you're going to make it to Rome. And so Paul, he has this impregnable defense about him, he, he, this unassailableness about him. He knows that Christ is Lord and God is with him and he knows 
He's in the majority. So the prosecution has given their case in verses one through nine. Now I'm gonna read Paul's defense and I wanna read verses 10 through 21 and here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to read the text and then I wanna come back and just walk through the text with you and then I wanna close the message today with four practical things that you and I can take away from the message today that I hope uh, that will encourage you as a follower of Christ and will also help you emulate what Paul did when he was falsely accused by the Sanhedrin, by Tertullus, the, the prominent lawyer of their day. In verse 10, let me, let me back up to go to verse 10. Then Paul, after the governor, that's Felix, had nodded to him to speak, Paul answered, now he's going to begin his defense. Inasmuch as I know that you, Felix, have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully Oh, that word cheerfully. Paul is in prison, but his spirit is free. Uh, he, he is in extenuating, painful, difficult circumstances, and yet he has this cheerfulness about him, this joy about him. He says, I will respond to you, Felix, cheerfully, and I will answer, apologia is the Greek word, I will answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, come on now, the way. That, that is code for followers of Jesus. They have been accused of being a sect or a heresy. Uh, they follow the Nazarene. And Paul says, no, we follow, we're part of the way. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, which they call a sect. So I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God. Church family, what does Paul have in God? Hope. Say it one more time. Hope. He said, I have hope. Isn't that awesome? You say, well, how can I be cheerful and how can I have hope when I am incarcerated or when I am in pain or where I'm in a very difficult situation in life? How in the world can I be cheerful and have hope and peace when you're obsessed with Christ, you can. When he is your all, when you love him and you know him and you're walking with him and you're willing to, be, to even suffer for him, I'm telling you, almighty God comes to your aid. He gives you peace. He gives you joy and cheerfulness even in the midst of your conflict, even in the midst of you being accused falsely. I have hope in God, which they themselves, they also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, Paul's still giving his defense. I myself always strive only time that word is used in the entire Greek New Testament, the word askeo, strive. It's an interesting word. I strive, Paul says, to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult, they ought to have been here. I love this. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. Or else, let those who are here themselves say if they have found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. Unless it is this. This one statement which I cried out concerning, he's standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead I am being judged by you this day. The prosecution and now his defense. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for this, this defense that you gave Paul to make for his case. And Lord, we learn from him. We learn, first of all, how to get in trouble with the world because we stand for you. But we also learn from him, Lord, to have hope and to have cheerfulness and to have grace and peace in the midst, Lord, even of our imprisonment, our incarceration, our torture, our being misunderstood. 
that you, the Holy Spirit, greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. And Lord, I'm praying today. It's such a fascinating passage of Scripture. Thank you, Lord, for putting it on my heart uh, to preach your word, to go line upon line, verse by verse, to share with your people, God, these precious, dear people called Great Hills Baptist Church, all of these people online, Lord, watching us from all over the world as they tune in to a message from the Word of God. May they, Lord, be encouraged. May their faith be strengthened, O God. And may we all, when we walk out of this church building today, may we be even more resolute, even more determined to say, I will serve the Lord come what may. I will speak up. I will speak out. I will just allow God to be my defense, and I'm going to let the whole world know about Jesus. Lord, would you help us do this? We need you, Lord. None of us can do this on our own. We absolutely need you, and I need you, Lord. Would you help me now as I preach your word? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So verse 11, when you go back to verse 11, because you may ascertain that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem. What I want to encourage you to do is go ahead and get your Bible and open it up. Open your tablet, uh, open up your screen, whatever, because what I'm going to do is walk you through the Word of God. This is sort of like a homily, if you will. Homily in homiletics just means the pastor is going to walk you through Scripture. And I really encourage you just to take a pen or, or make a note on your tablet because I, I, I think as you, as you read the Word of God and hear the Word of God, I hope you've come today to learn, to exercise your mind, to worship God with your, with your mind. Paul's argument, his syllogism goes something like this. Now, Felix, here I am. I am being falsely accused by the Sanhedrin. They are primarily accusing me of sedition and treason. Now, there's some things that Rome would absolutely not tolerate. They would not tolerate a troublemaker. If you tried to disturb the Pax Romana, the golden age of Rome, whoever you are, whatever religion you have, if you try to disturb the peace, they're going to come down on you with an iron fist. And Paul knows that. And Paul is like, he's telling them, look, I am not guilty of that. By the way, I've only been back in town for 12 days, for heaven's sake. How in the world... In just the brief amount of time that I have, how could, how could I ever cause all of the disrupt, disruption, all of the dissension, all of this trouble that they are accusing me? Well, he got Felix's attention. Because Felix, he's rational and he's thinking, he's, he's probably asking, yeah, really? How in the world could they accuse you of being such a troublemaker and you've, been, you've only been back for like 12 days? All right, verse 12. Paul says, nobody saw me doing the things that they are accusing me of doing. The charge of sedition, the charge of treason, as one writer says, was absolutely, categorically, totally false. Paul never sought to arouse the crowd to commit treason against Rome or to lead people in mass subversion to Rome. Now, Paul is in trouble not because he's a troublemaker for Rome, but because he is preaching the gospel. And these people are adamantly opposed to him preaching Christ. Who are those people? They are the religious leaders. They're the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They are the Sanhedrin. And here Paul is an outlier, right? He's preaching Christ boldly. He is talking about the resurrection from the dead. He's talking about that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And he has upset the Jewish leaders. All right, that's verse 12. Verse 13, they cannot prove the charges against Paul. The trumped up charge, the one that was absolutely false, not a shred of evidence, was that he had brought in a Gentile into the temple precincts. Trophimus was his name. Trophimus was never brought into. It's amazing how facts are stubborn things. Facts have a way of rising to the top. The truth has a way of rising to the top. Paul's like, look, I, I brought Trophimus into Jerusalem, yes, but I would never bring him into the temple because he's a Gentile. And there literally was a sign that said, you a Gentile, you walk through this, we're going to kill you. Have a happy day, the Jews. That, that, that's how they operated back then. 
And Paul's like, I, I never did that. Verse 14 is astounding. He moves now to his apologetic proper. And he's going to move from defense now to the gospel. Uh, he corrects the Sanhedrin in referring to Christianity as a sect or a heresy or a cult. And he refers to them as the way. Now, here's where Paul is going to teach us so much. He knows the truth. And he's going to talk to them about the truth of Jesus Christ's death, burial, watch this, the resurrection. And he is going to lean into the resurrection from the dead. By the way, Felix doesn't believe it. The Sadducees don't believe it. Most, most people would not believe in a bodily resurrection from the dead. I know the Epicureans didn't, the Stoics didn't, the Greek philosophers didn't. But Paul is saying, look, it's true. The tomb in Jerusalem is empty. The people like me, we have given our lives not for a fallacious thing, a lie, a myth, a fable, a story. I'm telling you, this is bed rot truth. Jesus Christ died on a cross. He was buried. He arose from the dead. That's why I'm being judged, Felix. That's why I'm being judged. It's because of the resurrection from the dead. And Paul goes on to say, look, I know the law. I know the writings. They say they know the law and the writings. He's talking about the law, the prophets, the writings, the, the literature, the Old Testament corpus, the, the literature of the Old Testament, which is interesting when Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, I just thought about this today. In verses three and four, he says, I, I preach to you the gospel that Christ died for our sins, watch this, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried he arose from the dead. Anybody else remember what that? According to the scriptures. The Old Testament predicts and prophesies a Messiah that would come and die and rise from the dead. You say, well, I'm from Missouri. You got to show me that. Okay, I will. You show me. I'll show you. In Isaiah 26, 19, the Bible says, the prophet says, your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall rise, awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Let me give you another one, Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Come now. Church, isn't that awesome? You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I love what Paul's doing. He's making an argument. He's making a case for his faith. And the key component of the Christian faith, as Wolfhart Pannenberg, the theologian, said, the crux of the matter, the hallmark of Christianity, you can boil it down to two things. Jesus died on a cross and glory to God, he arose from the dead, okay? And you say, but, but Brother Danny, I get that. I, I understand that. But let me ask you this. Are you telling people that? Are you telling people that the tomb is still empty? Are you telling them that there is a risen, reigning Savior in your heart that is empowering you to be the man of God that he's called you to be, to be the woman of God he's called you to be. You know, Paul, the reason he's in trouble is he's speaking. <laughs> he's telling it. He's living it. And whenever you preach Christ and live Christ, whenever you're so obsessed with Christ, I don't care what millennium it is, what epoch of time, era of time it is, whenever you and I are passionate for Jesus Christ and we speak, it will get us in trouble, but I would rather be pleasing to God than pleasing to man any day. So let me just ask you again, are you speaking that Christ is risen from the dead? If not, let me encourage you to incorporate this in your terminology, okay? In the way that you live, you got a wonderful opportunity two weeks from today. We're gonna celebrate like we celebrate every Sunday, but especially that day, it's Resurrection Sunday. So let's do what Paul does and let's get out and talk to people. I visited a man in a hospital one time, and when I walked in the door, he said, I just got to tell you something. Uh, I don't feel very well, 
and um, thank you for coming, but I don't feel very well. In other words, he was saying, I'm not just really thrilled that you're here, so if you're here, just pray and leave quickly. And I got that, you know. And people could communicate, you know, verbally and non-verbally. And so what I did, and I did this just a couple of weeks ago, well, actually a month ago in California with an Uber driver. Uber driver right here. Are you still driving Uber? Former Uber driver. So I did with him in California what I did with this gentleman in the hospital. In other words, I only had a brief amount of time and they said, yes, you can pray for me. So guess what I did? I prayed the gospel. Are you with me? Pray the gospel. Thank the Lord. And I pray of this guy, Lord, heal this guy. But may, may this guy most of all know, Lord, that he's lying in this hospital bed, that he's going to die. If not soon, then one day he will die. Let him know, Jesus, that you love him, that you died on a cross. You arose from the dead. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Wise as serpents, harmless as doves, Every opportunity you get, let us pray the gospel, preach the gospel, teach the gospel, say the gospel that Jesus Christ died and he arose from the dead. You said, but is it really that powerful? Is it really that potent? I encourage you, try it. Try it. In your neighborhood, students at school, speak up. Preach the gospel, live the gospel. This is what Paul has done. And then he goes from there to verse 16. He speaks of the ethical implications of the resurrection from the dead. He knows that he will appear one day before God. And he says, I want to have a clear, clean conscience before God and before mankind. The Greek word askeo, I mentioned it to you a moment ago. Verse 16, strive. It means to take great pains. It means to labor. Can I ask y'all something? Can I ask myself something? Is your conscience clean before God today? And can you say with Paul that you are without offense toward God and your fellow man? You can if you're obsessed with Christ. You cannot if you're obsessed with self. Verse 17, Paul continues. Let me just check your pulse for just a second. Are y'all okay? Are you all right? This is, this, is the, this is God's word, okay? You say, well, you... You got anything else, brother, share with us up there? I don't have anything else. I have the word of God. And we're gonna read it, we're gonna preach it, and by God's help, we're going to live it. Verse 17, Paul continues his defense before Felix. He tells him, I came to Jerusalem to worship God. I came and I brought an offering. I don't know that there's a comical scene, but if there is one, it's this one. I'm gonna try to reenact it for you. Mr. Felix, I came, you know, I've been traveling Macedonia, Achaia, I've traveled the known world, I've been taking up an offering for my Jewish people, because you know, and I know, that there's been tremendous famine and hardship in Jerusalem, and so I took up an offering, and I brought it to my family, and I can see Felix going, say what? And looking over at the Sanhedrin going, really? You're mad at a guy that's brought y'all money? that's trying to help your own countrymen live? And I can see the Sanhedrin going, you know, just, they didn't have anything to say. But Paul's telling the truth. He, he could also say, I did not come for war, I came for worship. I came bringing my offering. I, I came because I love my country. I love my, I love my city of, of Jerusalem. Verse 18, all right, we're almost done. We're going to verse 21, y'all hang in there. Verse 18, Paul refers to what happened in Acts 21. When the Jews from Asia came to the temple, accused Paul of bringing a Gentile into the precincts. He said, I, I, I never did that. Um, yes, you did. We know it as a fact. That's what you did. You brought that Gentile into this temple. He said, no, I did not. And, 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 and by the way, where's the evidence to corroborate that? Why don't you bring the people in and let them confront me? You've got the facts. He said, there are no facts. Trophimus was a Gentile. I'm not about to bring him into the temple. Y'all would kill him. In your righteous anger, you would kill him. Furthermore, I took upon myself the vow of the Nazarite. I washed my body. I cleansed my life. I've been on foreign soil. I was contaminated according to your law. So I brought these brothers in. And if you can check the record, when we came into the temple, these four guys were with me 
and I was not causing dissension. I was not saying anything. I was just trying to be obedient to God. I was trying to do the right thing. And, and, and is that not right? Sanhedrin, am I not telling the truth? And they couldn't say anything because Paul is telling the truth. Verse 19 was a devastating blow to the prosecution. Paul said the Jews who opposed him in the temple, they should be the ones accusing me. They are the ones should be here. Because I'm trying to tell you, these are the facts. This is what actually happened. I was there. Where is the corroborating evidence? There is none. Verse 20, then Paul points to the council and calls on them to point out any wrongdoing when he appeared before them in Jerusalem just a few days prior. In verse 21, Paul reiterates again. I love what he does. He closes his defense still sharing about the resurrection of the dead. Now, the Sadducees would totally dismiss this, but the Pharisees, remember, they still believed in angels and demons in bodily resurrections. And so there Paul is. He closes out his, I think, very powerful case of defense for himself. One writer, one writer Chuck Swindoll, says this, Paul was like a pit bull on a thief's leg. He was tenacious, and he adequately defended himself. There are four things I want to close with. Uh, and I'll, I'll be brief, but I think this will help you if you ever find yourself in a situation. Uh, like Paul, you never know. You, know, you, never know. You, you might be accused of being one of them at, at the job. You, know. or you might be threatened if you don't display a certain colorful rainbow across your desk. If you dare to speak up and say, I believe the Bible, I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. I actually believe in there's a, there's a biological male and a biological female. Look, if you dare say things like that, especially uh, in, in our postmodern, post-Christian, quickly becoming an anti-Christian culture, America, wake up. We've moved from postmodernism. We're almost, we're very, very close to an anti-Christian stance in many sectors in our nation. And all that evil needs is for good men and women of God to be quiet. And if you and I will continue to be quiet, according to Metaxas, we're going we're to reap in a judgment, a harvest that this world has never seen. So you never know. I might, I probably will before y'all, now, you might, but if we are in a situation like this, number one, when accused, remain calm and trust God. We don't read Paul stressed out, wringing his hands with worry. He already knows that God has made him a promise. God is going to be with him. God's going to walk him through his trial. So he is accused, that's right. He has been prosecuted, but he is calm and trusting, trusting God. I'm fighting a battle, Lord that you have already won. 1 Peter 4, 19, I want to encourage you with this verse, and it really encouraged me this week. Therefore, let those of you who suffer, if you suffer according to the will of God, come on now, I bet that Bible passage does not get many amens. You know what I'm saying? There, I am suffering. You are, some of you are suffering according to God's will. Could it be God's will that I suffer? Yes, yes. God, read the book of Job. Read the book of the, 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 the life of Paul. God allows this, and when God allows you and me to suffer, entrust your souls to a faithful creator God and do good. Do good. Number two, give the truth and state the facts. Paul calmly gives the truth before his accusers, and he states those stubborn things John Adams called, these stubborn things called facts. Okay. I got a text this week from a friend. He said, the truth will find its way to the top and expose the lies. Tell the truth. You don't have nothing to fear. Take advantage, number three, of every opportunity to share Christ. And this really has been uh, the, the thrust of this sermon uh, today. I can study this text. I can write my manuscript, and I do every, every Sunday. But I just don't know how the Holy Spirit's gonna take it and speak it through me to you 
but I'm finding that this is really the heartbeat of my message today. Take advantage of every opportunity and share Christ. Paul does this. He speaks the truth of the gospel. He speaks about the resurrection. Even in the midst of a hostile situation, um, he has the spiritual wherewithal to share Christ amidst false accusations. Can I encourage you to do that? Yes, it may cost you your job. Yes, it may cost you uh, your reputation. You might be accused of one of them. You may be accused of being uh, you know, hateful and intolerant and, and mean and, and, and unworthy, unfit even to live. But you share Christ. And you say, before God, I'm striving that my heart and my conscience is clean before God and really before anybody. I don't hate anybody. I love the Lord, but the word of God says, and this is the truth. Number four, enjoy and thank God for your freedom while you have it. Enjoy and thank the Lord for your freedoms. Last week I met with a, a mom and her daughter from Iran. They may be here today. I'm not going to mention your name, but after the service they came up to me and, and I got to meet them. They are, the mom is part of our ESL study. The daughter was pretty animated. She's very uh, bright, very educated in physics. And she told me, she said, um, you know, I have a lot of questions. And uh, she said, I'm from Iran. My mom is from Iran. My mom doesn't speak English. She's learning English. But here's something I would like to tell Americans. <laughs> she said, you have no, absolutely no idea how wonderful you have it. She said, I come from the most repressive, oppressive regime known to man against women. Women are the most persecuted species on the planet in my country. She says, in fact, a woman cannot even decide what clothes she's going to wear for the day. She has to be told by her husband that you can wear this, you cannot wear that, and she keeps her face covered, and, and, and she just lives her life. She, and, and this lady, she goes, look, I just wish I could tell everybody in America, you have it amazing. You have all these freedoms. And then we got to talk about the church, the underground church in Iran. And this woman, she told me, she says, look, I have great respect and admiration for those followers of Jesus in Iran, because if they are caught... If they are caught, it is the death of them. It is tremendous persecution. That same day, which was a week ago today, I went home and I got, an, I got a, a text from a former church member. Uh, they moved out of the, the city. They, they've, uh, they, they attend another church. I hated to see them go, but so is life. You know, <laughs> Life happens. You know, People come, people go. They join other churches closer to where they live. And that's exactly what she did. And she goes, we're hosting a, a group, the Frontliners, and they work with the persecuted church around the world. Yesterday, they shared a video with us that less than 100 people have seen it due to the sensitivity of the material. It shows what God is doing in Iran with the underground church. It is absolutely incredible and is so amazing and it is encouraging, end of quote. Now, is that a coincidence that I get that text the same morning that I hear this lady from Iran, from the same country, and what, what I would say to us is we really, really ought to enjoy, thank God, and appreciate the freedoms that we have. I think freedoms that are being encroached upon, and I would not be surprised in my lifetime that these freedoms are taken away. Can I say that again? Yeah. Freedoms that we should enjoy and appreciate. Freedoms that are being encroached upon day by day and very possibly in my lifetime will be taken away from us. And I don't know if this is a prophetic message. All I know is we need to wake up. We, we, need, to, we need to speak up. And we need to quit being so so timid and so 
so entrenched in sin ourselves that we don't have the moral authority to speak up for what we really believe. I think that's really at the heart of, of the matter. That some of us, some of you are walking with God, but it's such a guilty distance, you're ashamed to speak up because your life is not commensurate with the profession that you're making. If that's your case, can I just say, I hope this message helps you. I hope it convicts you. I hope it brings you to a point, Jeff, we were praying about this earlier, a point of repentance. That's something we've been really praying about, that God would give a spirit of repentance to our church, the church of Jesus Christ. We are here, and, and, and God has positioned us here. And, but what good are we if we're compromised with the world and catered to the world? What good are we if we close in our mouth my prayer is God would revive us. God would spark within us a, a, a joy and a cheerfulness to stand for Christ, speak his name, tell people I'm not ashamed. Christ arose from the dead. He died on a cross publicly humiliated for me. The least I can do is to have you look down upon me. And I'm gonna stand for Christ. And I'm, I'm through with my message, but I'm, I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading that the Spirit of God would speak to you. Lord, would you speak to us? Lord, this is your word. You, you have preserved it for us. And Lord, I'm praying that you would speak to your children, those of us who know you, Christ, those of us who are absolutely the silent majority. Would you infuse us with vigor and with power and conviction? Not that we would be mean in any way, but we would be gentle as a dove. But, but Lord, we'd be, uh, we, we would speak wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, befriending those who, who believe differently than us, loving them into your kingdom, speaking the word of God, speaking the truth of God. Thank you for Paul. Lord, he got himself in some hot water because he was so obsessed with you and he wanted to do the right thing. Lord, would you help us? Would you help us when our time comes, when our hour of trial comes, that we too would be bold, we would be faithful? Lord, please help us as the church to get over our petty differences and realize that Satan is our enemy. And he's doing everything in his power to divide and conquer us. But he can't, Lord, he can't. Greater is Jesus that's in us than Satan who is in this world. So, Lord, I'm praying today for courage. I'm praying for our church. In Jesus' name I pray.